Good morning. Uh, it's so, so good to be here together. Um, I want at least this being uh, Mother's Day, we want to honor the moms. We want to make sure uh, that each of you uh, women, not just moms, each woman uh, gets a plant. There's a succulent back there for you to, to take. Succulents are great plants for busy moms because they're pretty low maintenance uh, and, and that. So make sure you take one of those. Uh, and now we have a video, um, hopefully now anyway, we have a video uh, to honor moms for Mother's Day. Hey mom, on Mother's Day, we talk a lot about what moms do, what the many beloved women do in our lives. Schedules, school, homework, holidays, birthdays, big moments, you know the drill. But today, we want to celebrate something more. Things that go unseen, but not unnoticed. You are a deep well of care and compassion, patience and sensitivity. You embrace sacrifice and service and put dreams on hold, rest to the side, and treasure away so your family can have more. You burn the midnight oil, enter prayer closets, and wear down carpets, bringing our needs to the Lord. You are the tireless teacher, the weariless guard. You think deeply, trust truth, and speak blessings that flow for generations. You encourage and empathize, an ear to listen, and a shoulder to cry on, an outstretched hand and a gathering arm. Filled with dignity, fearless in the furnace, pouring yourself out to fill those around you. You are the very picture of quiet strength. By God's grace, you help us become what we were meant to be. Thank you, moms, grandmothers, aunts, mentors, all of you, for being who you are. Um, we're going to do call to worship. I'm so thankful for the grace of God. Um, I'm going to be reading from Matthew 25. Verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in the glory and all of the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another as he separates, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the internal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to me, to one of the least, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, 
but the righteous into eternal life. Amen. Father, we thank you so much that you are a great God. Very nice. And Lord, we've been reminded today how uh, when we pray, it's not just a, a platitude of well wishes, but it is a speaking to you, our God who hears us, our God who responds, our God who answers, who doesn't leave us. But Lord, you move and you move in power and presence. And Lord, you always do more than what we even know what to ask for. And Lord, in the midst of even what we don't understand, we find that you are always enough. So Lord, today I pray that you'd help us to continue to, um, to lean into the truth and reality of who you are as best as we know how. Pray that you would uh, help Pastor Steve now to speak your truth in your word. Help us to receive it with open and honest hearts. Holy Spirit, um, we know that your presence is here, and I pray that our answer to you would be yes today. In Jesus' name, amen. Boy, how about that music, that, uh, that song we just sang, Our God is Greater. Do you believe that this morning? I'm going to ask you again. That was weak. Do you believe that this morning, that our God is greater? All right, that's better, yeah. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, that is such a, a fundamental, foundational truth to Christianity that falls right in line with what we've been talking about as we've been kind of going through the Apostles' Creed, these, these basic truths, theological truths of, of Christianity that uh, uh, give us an, an anchor to resist the influence and, and pull uh, in this world that could cause a, a faithful follower, a Christian household, uh, a church to drift away uh, from what is real, what is true, and cave in to, to false teachings and outside pressures. And, you know, that, that creed came about so early on in the history of the church because it was needed then. And nothing has changed. That need still exists today. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but I have, that there's uh, a lot of pressure for Christians to say that their viewpoint has changed on certain things that we've evolved. Or there's this term out there now of, of deconstructing. We're deconstructing the faith that, uh, that we were taught uh, and reconstructing. Um, as kind of implied uh, of, of our own experience. Uh, and the reality is that, uh, while that's not necessarily a bad thing, uh, if there isn't an anchor in theological truth, if there isn't an anchor in what's real and what's true, boy, we're just going to be tossed about by the waves and left to every, every whim or curiosity uh, that we might have. And that's not faith. That's not God. That's not Christianity. And so we recognize in going through this series and looking closer at the Apostles' Creed, we recognize uh, that this creed is a, a powerful proclamation. They're not just words that we say from time to time, not just words that we read out of the bulletin or out of, uh, out of our hymnal uh, on occasion. But they are a proclamation in which we say, we speak, and we speak for the hearing uh, of one another, and we speak for the hearing of God, and we speak as a reminder to ourselves that I believe these things. And I believe these things in such a way that it totally changes how I live my life. If you have your bulletin with you, pull out the insert that has the Apostles' Creed on it. Uh, I want us to read together uh, up through the portion that we're going to cover today. So we're going to stop right before that last paragraph, okay? Uh, follow along with me um, if you are ready to proclaim these words as truths that changed your life. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. So Jesus has come, will come, to judge the quick and the dead. That's the portion that we're going to to focus on this morning. Uh, And it's the portion that focuses on uh, really the, the future role of Jesus. As the creed has progressed, we go from uh, the truth and the reality of God, uh, the Father, maker of heaven and earth, creator, to who Jesus was and what he has done in the past uh, with his death on the cross and his burial and his resurrection, to what he is doing now that we talked about last week, sitting at the right hand of God, reigning over his kingdom and interceding for you and for I to what he will do in the future. In this case, coming to judge the quick and the dead. Now, if you're sitting here listening to that and going, I'm good because I'm not very quick. I'm pretty slow. It's not what it means. Okay, we got we to gotta go back to, to what grandma or great-grandma may have thought of uh, with the word quick. Quick, in this case, means living. Uh, Some of you may have heard or used the expression, cut to the quick, right? Uh, If you you clip your dog's nails, uh, you don't want to cut them to the quick, otherwise they'll bleed, it's a mess, and drama and chaos ensues, and so on and so forth. Uh, But you're cutting to the the living part uh, of the nail in that case. Uh, So when we say Jesus is is going to judge the quick and the dead. We're saying that he is going to judge the living and the dead. And that's the the reality of what was recorded for us in Matthew's Gospel uh, that Tricia beautifully shared with us as our call to worship this morning. Uh, these, These reality, these words, that as Jesus taught, He set before us this standard of, you know what, it's almost as if he knew there was going to be things that were going to be argued about in church and debated, you know, uh, this doctrine over that doctrine and uh, some of the the deeper meaning or significance of things or, you know, what kind of music we use on Sunday morning in worship or uh, what, what kind of carpet we put down or, you know, all those things, goofy things that churches will argue about. Uh, at times. And Jesus stepped into this reality of, of belief in his judgment and talked about it in a deeply personal way in terms of how we treat the least of these, how we treat the least among us. And if there's one thing, one thing, that all of Christianity across all time should be able to agree on. It should be how we treat the poor. It should be how we treat those in need. And in that passage recorded by Matthew, uh, Jesus is saying, hey, church, how you treat the poor is how you care for me, how you interact with me. That perfectly describes your relationship with me. If you want to know whether you're spiritually alive or spiritually dead, look at how you treat the poor. If you won't bend your knee and care and service for the poor, then you haven't done so for Jesus. And the words that lie ahead is, you never knew me. And I don't know about you, as, as many times as I've read that and thought about that, I don't think there's any more terrifying words in the Bible than to think and believe I've lived a life of service to 
to King Jesus. And in that time of judgment for him to say, away from me, you never knew me. Because I made it about something else. Because I made it about me, or I made it about, uh, boy, could we even say church activities and church business and things like that, and missed the point. That it's about how we treat those in need. And the way we treat those in need reflects Jesus within us. I want to share with you this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 1 through 10. And it gives, I think, quite a commentary for life on earth today. As Paul wrote this to the, the church at Corinth, he wrote, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked, for while we are still in this tent we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And I think this is such a great commentary for, for life today here on earth because uh, as Paul wrote this, you know, he was speaking to realities then, but uh, we read this today and we go, man, there are some times that if I'm being honest, I just don't really like the things I see going around me. And I don't feel at home in this world. And it's a reminder that for the Christian, for the follower of Jesus Christ, our citizenship is in the kingdom of God. And this earthly home is temporary for us. It is a temporary dwelling place. And so this place ought to feel uncomfortable. You know, I've had uh, conversations with, with uh, some of the folks at New Dawn, and, you know, Michelle and I have talked about this with uh, uh, different folks who rotate through our upstairs uh, for various periods of time. Uh, and really the idea is... This isn't your home. We want you to feel safe, but not comfortable, right? We want to give you a safe space, but we don't want this to be comfortable. And so at home, whatever our home is, our sense of home is a place where we feel fully comfortable. Uh, that's what gives us our sense of home. And that place for the follower of Jesus Christ is in the kingdom of heaven, not here on earth. So we ought to feel uncomfortable here. You ought to feel discontented. And I would add, if you are not, or when we are not, feeling that way, then that should be a caution flag for us. And we might want to consider who or what has the greatest influence in our life? Society or God? If we're comfortable in this world, in this mess, then that indicates a problem for us. Verse 5 here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
uh, reminds us that God has prepared us for this very thing through the gift of His Holy Spirit, which we'll talk more about next week on Pentecost Sunday. But He's given us, He's prepared us through this whole, very thing, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, as a guarantee, a deposit of what is to come, uh, life fully in the presence of God. So the Holy Spirit serves as a guarantee of the promise of life fully in the kingdom of heaven. The Holy Spirit also is uh, described in the Bible as our helper, our advocate in this world. God's word here in 2 Corinthians 5 uh, goes on to tell us that we survive and thrive here because of the Lord. So though we aren't comfortable, we do well here. Things happen here only because of the Lord. Not our best efforts, but because of Him. And accordingly, verse 9 says, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. But I want to elaborate here briefly. Uh, within the church in general, within our church, within other churches, there's often discussion that crops up about whether or not a certain thing uh, or another is sin. You know, is this sin? You know, is, is, is it a sin to drink or uh, in today's society, you know, is, is it a sin to use marijuana or, uh, you know, is gambling a sin, so on and so forth. And many of you have heard in different settings be raising the point lately that that is completely the wrong question to be asking. See, if we are living according to the Word and we understand that our aim is to please Him, we need to change the question to, is this sin, is this wrong, from that to, is this holy or does this please Him? I think it was Dave Petherbridge a week or two ago, he and I were talking and happened to be talking about, about drinking. Um, and he made the comment along these lines, hey, if you can drink and drink to the glory of God, then have at it. And I'm not saying that that's an impossible thing, right? But it reframes how we think about such things. If we can gossip and do so in a way that gives glory to the Lord, have at it. You can't do it. Okay, that one I'm going to tell you, you can't do it. For the Christian devoted to serving and honoring God, which is a Christian, that our question needs to be, does this thing please Him? Does this honor Him? Is this holy? Not, can I get away with it? We have that mindset, we're well conditioned towards it, you know. Uh, we know how fast we can get away with driving across 61 and, and drive by the police and not get stopped. We know about how fast we can go on, on I-75. If you tip over about 82 miles an hour, you're going to get stopped. Ask me how I know. Um, and we have that mindset of what can I get away with? instead of what honors. And so in this world that is not our home, where we should feel uncomfortable, and we as followers of Jesus Christ are intended to stand out as different against this world, it means we're going to live differently. We're going to do some things that are differently. It's not how much can we get away with looking like the rest of the world. So why, why does all this matter? This sin versus holiness, this, you know, at, at home on earth, feeling at home on earth or not, and so on and so forth. Well, it comes down to this reality stated in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, it, was, it was stated in our call to worship, stated here in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 5, 
uh, that Jesus is going to judge for what we have done here on earth. In the case of 2 Corinthians 5, Paul wrote it this way, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All, meaning fast or slow, or somewhere in between. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he or she has done in the body, whether good or evil. Each of us, whether living or dead in the spirit, whether good or evil, will face the judgment seat of Christ. We will give an account. There's no one exempt from this. And that's a little bit scary, right? You know, we could try to hide like Adam and Eve did. It won't work. We could try to run like Jonah did. He'll find you. We could try to make excuses like Moses did. It doesn't matter. I want you to repeat after me. I will be judged for all I have done, whether good or evil, by Jesus Christ. That's the truest thing that you will hear today. But the good news of the gospel is that when the gavel falls and you're declared guilty because each of us have fallen short of the glory of God, Jesus renders a sentence, the just punishment for your sin. And that just punishment is death. The wages of sin is death. For those who accepted what we would call a, a plea deal in the court system today and acknowledged their guilt by confessing and repenting, I am a sinner. By your power, God, I want to turn away from this. And choosing the ultimate rehabilitation program, living like Jesus, Jesus says, I've already served your sentence. Let's cover But for those who do not accept the plea deal and choose to stand on their own, they will receive the due punishment for their sin. They will receive uh, that consequence that is death. And we've all thought, and we've all heard people raise the question, isn't this cruel? How could a loving God do just that. It's such a common question with an important answer. God is so good in this that for those who accept the plea deal and acknowledge their guilt and accept the rehabilitation program of following the teachings of Jesus and walking through this world, uh, striving to live the way that he lived. God is so good that he's given citizenship everlasting in his kingdom. He saves us. God is also so good and kind, not cruel, that if someone chooses to reject him, says, I don't believe, I don't want anything to do with you. He is so good and kind that he does not force them to spend life everlasting in his presence, in his kingdom. Because that would be prison for someone that has rejected him. That would be cruel to say, though you hate me, you must live forever with me. So it's God's justice and his justness that he says to those who reject him, you've made your choice, you have your way. I'm not going to force you into something you do not want. So 
So there's so much to say about living your life like Jesus. And it is a fundamental truth that there is a heaven and hell and you have a choice to make. And it's a choice that you have to make actively, not passively. If you just let it go and wait and see what happens, you are passively choosing to walk away from God, to neglect God. We have to make this choice daily. And church, on this day, Mother's Day, and it was kind of funny as, as we were working through worship planning, a couple of folks said, boy, this sounds like quite the Mother's Day sermon. And I said, well, really it is, because it's the ultimate love, and it's a truth that is, is so critical to the very fabric of society. Everybody, but moms, women, your spiritual legacy matters. Matters far more than you realize. How you teach this to the, your children, your grandchildren, the example that you set at home and wherever you're active through the week, it matters. Because in more instances than we would like. You are the only Jesus, the only Bible that many people see. So how you live matters. We have amongst us a generation with an unprecedented need of spiritual mothers and fathers. Not physical or genetic moms and dads necessarily, but spiritual mothers and fathers that will teach them how to live like Christ, will teach them the truth of Christ. People who will be present. People who will listen and pray. Not just tell and judge and command. There is tremendous need for you. We need people, men, women, who are committed to holding on to others as you hold on to Jesus until that person is holding on to Jesus themselves. That connection is no longer automatic or a part of our culture. That doesn't exist anymore. We need moms, we need women, we need men who are committed to loving God so much that the godless in your life matter and take a priority. That you are the one praying and listening. That you are the one who is indeed setting an, a, a realistic, a true example of Jesus in their lives. There's an old book called The Kneeling Christian, and in there it says... That there is nothing the devil dreads so much as prayer. His great concern is to keep us from praying. Someone has wisely said, Satan laughs at our toiling, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. Women amongst us today, everybody but women, amongst us today. How's your prayer life? Does Satan tremble when you pray? I know for, for me, thinking about my childhood, you know, I grew up in a Christian home. Blessed, so fortunate to grow up in a Christian home. Going to church. Um, being taught the, the ways of God and His Word. And yet, I could think, from the youngest age, <clears throat> kind of a crazy image, 
A gal in church, uh, Mrs. Tobian, I have no recollection of what she looked like at all, but I can picture clear as day her finger going along the lines in the hymnal as we sang in church. Mrs. Tobian was invested in me. She was a spiritual mother who was holding on to me as she held on to Jesus. And a little bit older, my first Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Bishop, I can remember what she looked like. And there was Mrs. Kuzina, and there were a couple of different Mrs. Berries. One of them happened to be named Dorothy, uh, which makes me smile here in Gladwin. Um, there were uh, Mrs. Mrs. Hartwick, uh, you know, some familiar names uh, that just were people who were spiritual mothers to me, who held on to me as they held on to Jesus. These are people who I know prayed at critical times in my life. And these are people I know that as they prayed and God moved in response to their prayer, Satan trembled. And we need that today. As you think about your prayer life, does Satan tremble? Look at the young people in your life that you interact with. How are they doing spiritually? And this isn't a word of condemnation, and I know, uh, you know we all do, but women especially, boy, it seems like it's easy to feel guilty. And this isn't intended for that. But this is a word of encouragement and a challenge issued. Would you rise up, even if, even if you're inclined to stand up right now, would you rise up and commit to being the most powerful woman you could be? One who unites with Jesus and through prayer causes Satan to tremble. That's God's Mother's Day blessing. That's His gift to all of creation through women. Women who care and nurture. Women who will, will hang on to others as they hold on to Jesus. Women who will join with God in praying prayers that cause hell to tremble. That's God's Mother's Day blessing and call for His church today. Heavenly Father, by the blood of Jesus, we come to You and acknowledge our need for You. Lord, we know that uh, amongst us, uh, perhaps in this very room today, but certainly at our homes and our communities, are those who don't yet acknowledge or refuse to acknowledge their need for you. Uh, yet, Lord, by your power, give us the strength to hold on to them as we hold on to you until they find their way to you, Lord. Father, I pray for, for all, but especially the, the women this Mother's Day morning, that you would remind them of the strength they have in you to be world changers, Lord. To pray prayers that causes Satan to tremble as they pray over children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and co-workers and neighbors and so on. Lord, we know that the way that Satan attacks and the way that he attacked the first woman was through creating doubt. We pray, Lord, that we would be a church that surrounds one another and encourages one another, that that doubt would not gain even a foothold or even a moment's notice. That each woman here today, that each that could not be with us today, that each that joins us online, 
would know the confidence they could have in you because the victory has been won and by your spirit we will do even greater things than your son Jesus did here I pray Lord that we would be a church that honors you by making a difference by bending our knee to the poor to the least of these amongst us by seeing those who aren't seen by meeting needs that aren't known and be by continuing to be and ever more so a body of believers who praise and sees you do amazing things we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.